This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. We're looking at uh, F4 global variant, and we're just about to look at the uh, rights and obligations of the buyer and the seller. Now, remember, um, we're in the area of considering the United Nations Convention on Contracts for the International Sale of Goods. And this opening line tells us about what the problem is, that the rights and the obligations of the buyer and seller. The buyer's remedies arising from the seller's breach of contract. So the seller is saying either I don't want to go ahead with this contract, I'm not going to deliver, or the seller is in breach with reference to conformity. Uh, and in both of those situations, of course, the buyer must have rights because the buyer is the injured party. These rights for the buyer are actually very similar indeed to the rights for the seller in the event that the buyer commits the breach. So we have required proper performance, and all of these I shall explain. The required proper performance, avoid the contract, proportionally reduce the contract price, and seek damages. Now those three are very, very similar to the seller's rights in the event that the buyer breaches. And seek damages is exactly the same. Either party may seek damages to compensate them for the financial loss that they have suffered as a result of the other person's breach. So I shall explain these three and we'll talk about damages towards the end of the lecture. Damages may be claimed by the buyer and the seller incidentally. Damages may be claimed by the buyer even though they have claimed one of those other three, the requirements of proper performance. If damages have been suffered, then the court, the International Court, the United Nations Convention rules would say that the injured party is entitled to monetary compensation. So we're looking at, first of all, this, this first one, proper performance. And the initial situation down to there, these first four points, this is where the buyer may require the seller to honour the contract. It's, the seller is saying, I don't want to go ahead. I'm, I'm not interested anymore in sending you these goods. And the buyer says, but we're in a contract, so you have to go ahead and sell them. Ah, yeah, but the price has risen uh, for these goods since we entered the contract, says the seller. So I'm not going to sell them to you at $2 each when the current market value or current market price is $3 each. And the buyer says, I'm sorry, but that's what we agreed. You'd sell them to me at $2. So the buyer may require the seller, may say, no, you have to go ahead and do it. But if the buyer has already himself taken action to uh, negate the contract, for instance, the buyer might already have given indication that they want to avoid the contract. Well, in that situation, they cannot then do a 180 degree shift and say, I want you to honour the contract, I insist that you honour the contract. So the buyer may lose that right if he's already taken action inconsistent with the requirement of performance. The buyer can extend the time period. So we have a time period within which the seller has to deliver the goods and the seller says, I can't do them, it's become impossible for me to deliver these goods so I'm therefore not going to be able to do it on time. Well, the buyer can say, I understand, you've got a problem, uh, I'll extend the time period instead of delivery within two months, which expires, for instance, next week, uh, I shall extend, I'll give you another two months on top of that. So the buyer may extend uh, in order to allow the seller to conform and to uh, perform proper performance. And finally, and this, this is something which I probably need to explain, an order by the court of specific performance Specific performance is an equitable remedy. It's a remedy which exists in equity. It's a fair remedy. It's an e equitable remedy. An equitable equity means it's a fair remedy. Uh, and it's why the court says, do it. Just do it. Never mind saying you don't want to go ahead and perform your part of the contract. Do it. And so the court directs and, and instructs and insists that the seller should go ahead and perform his agreed part of the contract. Remember, the contract 
is, is an agreement and it's offer and acceptance. We have a legal agreement. So specific for performance is where the court says do it. Just very quickly, I'll just tell you that the opposite of specific performance, I'll just write it on the side here, is an injunction. An injunction is where somebody's doing something and, and somebody complains and says, you can't do that. You can't build a wall just outside my window. You're depriving me of my right of light. And so they'll appeal to the court, and the court says, stop it. Stop building that wall. Knock it down now. So an injunction is the opposite of specific performance. There are a couple of others of equitable remedies. Restitution is one, and rescission is another. If we come across those, then, then I'll, I'll explain what they are. But let's just leave it at that. Specific performance, a court will order possibly a specific performance if it is consistent with existing local law. And if it's available, if it's no longer possible for the seller to perform their share of the contract, then there's no point in saying specific, specific performance. The seller, for instance, has gone into liquidation then they can no longer perform their share of the contract. We move on to the second type of proper performance problem, and that's where we have reference to non-conformance. Do you remember non-conformance? Non-conformance is where we're looking at goods which are delivered should conform with the details of the contract with reference to quality, quantity, description, and packaging. So those are the four elements of proper performance, sorry, of conformity. And if the goods delivered do not conform, then the buyer should have and does have rights against the seller. So if the breach by the seller is with reference to non-conformance of the delivered goods, the buyer may require the seller to repair them. If non-conformity, if the non-conformance is, is minor, it's immaterial, or not immaterial as such, is minor, uh, and rep reparable, then the buyer may require the seller to repair them. But if it's beyond repair, if the, the non-conformity is not reparable, then the buyer may insist that the seller should replace them, take the damaged goods away and replace them with conforming goods. The seller may seek to remedy. If goods don't conform, then the buyer will notify the seller and say, these goods, they, they don't conform, they're, they're not exactly what I ordered. And so the seller will come round and say, ah, I understand what the problem is. Yes, I can, I can remedy that. I can uh, remedy the failure to perform. So long as that doesn't cause unreasonable delay to the buyer. And the buyer, therefore, should not be unreasonably inconvenienced. For this to apply... This is interesting. Not interesting on this page, but it is interesting. For this to apply, the seller has to notify the buyer and says, OK, I'll come round and I'll repair it. And uh, for that to be acceptable, the buyer has to notify the seller of the buyer's acceptance of the seller's offer to repair. And the buyer must actually receive the notification. The, the seller says, OK, I'll come round and repair it. And the buyer then has to respond. But what if the buyer doesn't receive this notification that the seller is going to come around and repair it? Well, this leads on to an even greater problem, even more interesting problem. And that's this. If the buyer doesn't receive the notification, then it's not possible for the buyer to respond and say, yes, OK. But... If the buyer fails to reply, the seller is entitled to assume that the buyer has accepted late performance, that the seller will come round and, and repair it. If the buyer doesn't reply, do you remember in an earlier lecture, do you remember we had the concept that the silence cannot be acceptance? Well, it struck me as I was reading this, in preparation of reading through it quickly to make sure what the, the lecture is going to be about, which direction it's going to go. When I was reading this, I'm thinking, well, this is where silence is acceptance. If the buyer fails to respond, 
If a buyer fails to give notification of their acceptance of the seller's offer to repair the goods and therefore render proper performance, then that silence is acceptance. Strange. When goods are delivered before the due date, Again, this is interesting, and I never really understood the second possibility. Where they, the goods are delivered before the due date, the buyer may accept delivery, which is what I would assume would be standard, would be normal. You order something for delivery on the 20th, it arrives on the 18th. I only order these for the 20th. Yeah, but we were in your area, so we delivered them on the 18th. The buyer may accept that, but interestingly... The buyer can refuse it and say, no, take them away. Come back on the 20th and deliver the goods then, like we agreed. So I find that interesting. Refuse delivery until the contract is dead. I find that particularly interesting. Another one is, is where the seller sends excess goods. If they send too few, then the buyer will say, not send me enough. So the seller says, okay, well, I'm going to send you the rest within a reasonable time because I've still got time before the contract date. But what happens if the seller sends too many? So we order 100, and 120 are delivered. The buyer can reject that excess 20 and just keep the 100. Or they can keep 120 and pay pro rata, pay the same contract rate for the 100, as applied to 120. So if they had ordered it at $2 each, then you'd still pay 120 but at $2 each. But the buyer may also choose to, to, to keep 116 and reject the other four. And keep the 116, the extra 16 at $2 each. Now this is interesting because I imagine, and I have no reason to, to believe this, other than it just seems practical. Remember we're talking about international set of goods. So the seller has sent 120 in response to an order for 100. And the buyer says, I'll keep 116, but you can come and collect the other four. Is it going to be worthwhile, the seller, crossing national borders, to go and pick up the excess four, and bring them back to the warehouse? Or is the seller in all probability likely to say, keep them? Now, if that's the case, the seller in all probability is going to say, keep them, free. Wouldn't you, after the first one, if the seller continues to send you wrong goods or excess goods, wouldn't you say, I'll keep 108. And the seller says, keep the rest. So you get 12 free, which is 10%, isn't it? It's 10% discount. Or would you actually say, I only ordered 100, that's all I want. And the seller says, damn it, our ordering system has gone down again. Sorry, listen, it's not worth our while to come and collect them. You keep that extra 20 free. That's worth thinking about. If you're ever at the, the wrong end like this, if you're ever a buyer in a situation where a seller sent you too much, be honest about it and say, look, you sent me an additional 20, which I didn't want. Then it's up to the seller to come and collect them, if it's worth the seller's while. If the buyer accepts some or all, we've just gone through that, the buyer must pay for the excess at the same price, at the same contracted rate. That would require proper performance, okay? Remember, the buyer may require proper performance, may avoid the contract, may proportionately reduce or may seek damages. Those are the four rights. Well, we've just looked at proper performance. So we're now the second one is avoid the contract. There's the third one, proportionately reduce the contract price. So avoid the contract. The buyer may avoid the contract where seller is in fundamental breach. Fundamental breach is a major breach with reference to quality quantity description that timing even that is a fundamental breach so the buyer has the opportunity to avoid once the seller commits the breach and it is a major breach 
the buyer can just opt out of the contract and say, no, I no longer want to go ahead with this contract. And that is what avoidance means. I no longer want to go ahead. You have committed a breach. It is a major breach. I don't want to deal with you anymore. They can also avoid where the seller fails to deliver. Well, surely that's fundamental, isn't it? If the fair seller fails to deliver, the buyer simply says, I'm not going ahead and don't expect any more orders from me either. Doesn't have to say that, but that's what I would expect to happen. Or the seller gets notice that delivery will not be possible on the contract date or any extension. It's not possible. Why? Because I'll be dealing with the enemy or because the goods are no longer available. The goods have been destroyed. I'm no longer in business. That's fundamental. So the buyer may avoid that contract, avoid it in that situation because of frustration. In the situation that the goods no longer exist, the contract is frustrated. Such a declaration of avoidance is evidence only if it's made by notice from the buyer to the seller. So if you're avoiding the contract, tell the seller and that's it, the contract is over. But you may claim damages. Pro why did that disappear? Proportionally reduce the contract. <laughs> Proportionally reduce the contract price is a further one. The, th the third right, isn't it? The third right of the buyer. And for non-conformity breach, the buyer may reduce the contract price in proportion to the breach. I find that a difficult one. Non-conformity, unless it's um, quantity, for instance. But if it's quality, well, maybe the goods that were delivered are damaged or second quality, they're not top quality goods. But if you've ordered screws, if you order a screw with a length of five centimeters and the goods that are delivered are a four centimeter screw, how do you reduce that? According to proportionally reduce, you wanted a five centimeter screw. So is a four centimeter screw good enough for you? And if it is, presumably reduce proportionally, reduce it by 20%. If the seller corrects the non-conformity, the buyer can't reduce. I'm sorry, didn't mean to send you five centimeter screws. I'm sending you some four centimeters and please have the five centimeters ready for when my driver gets there with the four centimeters, with the, with the five centimeters and you can give me back the four centimeter screws. If third party rights are involved, if we're breaching copyright, if we're breaching trademarks, if we're breaching anything, if we're breaching third party rights, or if some third party has got entitlement and the goods are not free of any lien or encumbrance, we came across those words in the last lecture. In the event that third party rights are involved, then the buyer may reduce the contract price on discovery of those third party rights. Obligations of the buyer. Remember, we've just been looking at the rights the rights of the buyer. Now we're looking at the obligations of the buyer. We can look at the rights and obligations of the seller as well within this, this chapter. But we're looking at the obligations of the buyer. What must the buyer do? He must take delivery. He's in a contract. The goods uh, that are delivered are as agreed in the contract. It's the buyer's obligation to take delivery of those goods and must pay the agreed price for those goods, and must enable the seller to deliver those goods. So the buyer must be available if the contract date is the 20th, and that's a Sunday, the buyer must be there on the Sunday in order to accept delivery of those goods. There I find this bit interesting. If the price is not specified within the contract, so up here we're looking at the obligation of the buyer with reference to amount. And here we're looking at, and we'll come back to amount, here we're looking at place. And down here we're looking at the timing. So three elements of the obligations of the buyer. The amount. If the price isn't specified within the contract, it's assumed that both the buyer and the seller intended the price to be the one which prevailed at the time the contract was entered into. But I find it strange that an international sale of goods, sale and purchase of goods, I find it strange that the price wouldn't be identified. However, there has to be, presumably, situations where it isn't. And in that situation, the convention says that it is assumed that the price intended by both the buyer and the seller should be the one 
that existed, that prevailed at the time the contract was entered into. If price is determined by weight, then the weight is the net weight. Now, the net weight is the weight of the items, weight of the goods, without any packaging. So it's just the weight of the goods. We also have another problem with that, and that is some goods absorb water, absorb moisture and liquid, and that makes them obviously heavy. I'm thinking particularly of material like, like wool or cotton, but material like that. And the net weight is the weight of the dry material. So we'd have to dry the wool, have to dry the cotton in order that we could then weigh it. Unless the action of drying damages the goods. The goods have to be kept wet. In that situation, then it would have to be by negotiation, by agreement within the contract, that the weight that we shall use to measure is the wet net weight. That's a problem. That's a problem to say that, the net wet rate or the wet net rate. Weight, the, the net wet weight rate. Okay. Place the place of payment. If it's not specified in the contract, then the place is at the seller's place of business, and the seller's responsibilities cease at that time. So the buyer's obligations take place or take effect with effect from X works. If it's not specified, if there's no place specified then the sale is effective at the seller's place of business. If the price is payable and the goods are delivered to the buyer, then at the place where delivery takes place. Because until that time, until they're actually at the place for delivery where the money becomes payable, until then, it's still the seller's responsibilities. Timing, timing of payment is not specified. If it's not specified, then it should be on delivery of the goods, the documents, but only after the buyer has had the opportunity to examine the goods. Now, remember I said in an earlier lecture, it strikes me as inconceivable that every time goods are delivered to a buyer, the buyer will open all those goods, a hundred washing machines, and he rips apart the packaging to have a look at those, those washing machines to see if there's any damaged ones. So I still find a, I still have a problem here. Only after the buyer has examined the goods, I find it a little bit awkward. But that's what the convention says. The seller may include a contract term, which states that titles of the goods shall not pass until payment has been made. That, that's called the Romalpa Clause, and it's a 1976 case between a Belgian Dutch, a Dutch company, and an English company. And the case is actually called, I'll give it to you, but there's no real need for you to, to remember it, Aluminium Industry Vazen BV, which is the Dutch equivalent of Limited, and Romalpa Aluminium Limited, and it's a 1976 case. And it's an international sale of goods, you can see, because it's a Dutch company selling to an English company. And it's a dirty trick. It was the first time this had happened, the first time it had come to court. And as a matter of routine, terms and conditions of sale, Aluminium Industry Varsen had written on the bag, it says terms and conditions, it said at the bottom of the invoice, it said for terms and conditions, see over. And on the bag, within the terms and conditions of sale, was a clause that said, title to the goods in this invoice shall not pass to the purchaser, nor any subsequent purchaser, until the amount of the invoice has been paid. Until this invoice has been paid in full, title to the goods shall not pass. So you deliver the goods and you don't pay. And you maybe use those goods and convert them into a finished product. 
and you may sell that finished product to your own customers and then you go into liquidation and you don't pay the, the supplier, you don't pay aluminium industry and the liquidator is appointed and the liquidator is busy working in the office seeing what inventory is left, trying to collect the receivables and so on, writing to the liabilities, the, the payables and one payable comes over, it's a Dutchman, comes over knocks on the door of Ramal for Aluminium and says, are you the liquidator? And he says, yes. He said, well, I've come to take back my inventory. It was tin foil, aluminium tin foil, and it's converted into tin foil trays and tin foil plates and, and, and rolls of tin foil for kitchen use. And this Dutchman says, I've come to take back my tin foil and to tell you that I have a claim on those receivables that Romalpa thinks are receivable for it because my invoice says title to these goods shall not pass through conversion until the amount has been paid in full and I shall follow the goods into the hands of subsequent purchasers, Romalpa's customers and claim the money that those Romalpa customers still owe to Romalpa. That was a staggering case. In the UK, all oh, hell was let loose. Never before had we seen anything like that. 1976, it's not that long ago in terms of English law. 41 years ago, some of you, I know some of you were not even born then, but I was. I can remember 1976. I'm not going to tell you how well I can remember 1976. So that's called a Romalpa clause. And the seller may include a clause that says title shall not pass until the goods have been paid for in full. In addition, when carriage is involved, the seller can state the goods shall not be released to the buyer until payment is made. And not only that, but if it comes to the seller's attention that the buyer is not likely to be able to pay, the seller can contract, con sorry, can contact the carrier and say, don't deliver. Don't deliver those goods. It's an interesting scenario as well, isn't it? That this carrier has arrived at the buyer's premises. The goods are being unloaded and the carrier gets a phone call. Don't deliver. I'm already halfway through. Well, stop. Don't let them take any more. Because if the seller becomes aware that the buyer is not likely to be able to pay, then the seller can stop the carrier from delivering. If there's an agreed date of payment, the buyer should pay on that date without the seller having to request it. And the buyer is obliged to take delivery goods and take all those reasonable steps to enable delivery by the seller, which is what I just said about Sundays, for instance. If it's a bank holiday, for instance, if it's a national holiday and they had overlooked this fact, uh, when the agreement was signed and the date specified for delivery was agreed, then the buyer should have somebody available at the buyer's premises to enable the seller to effect delivery. I said at the start of the chapter that we're looking at the buyer's and the seller's rights and obligations, and we're now onto the seller's remedies from the buyer. I also said that the seller's remedies are very similar to the buyer's. And the buyer's remedies were to require proper performance and to be able to avoid the contract or to proportionately reduce the uh, purchase price or to seek damages. And we'll come to damage. I did say we'll come to damages towards the end of the lecture. But here we have the seller's remedies. And if you think about it, require acceptance and require payment is the equivalent of proper performance. And then the right to avoid the contract is the same, and the right to seek damages is the same. So the seller's remedies are effective and the same as the buyer's remedies, but from the, the other side of the coin, the obvious side of the coin. Here we've got acceptance and payment. That's these first two. The seller may enforce contractual terms. Of course they can with reference to acceptance and payment, unless the seller's taken steps which are not compatible with that right. For instance, the seller has notified the buyer that the seller is going to avoid the contract. For whatever reason, the seller tells the buyer, I'm avoiding the contract, in which case 
This is, for instance, where the goods are still on the way to the buyer. So you can't require acceptance of the goods when you've notified the buyer that the carrier has got instructions not to deliver. It's possible for the seller to extend the time period for the buyer to make they meet their obligations. I'm having trouble paying. I just need another couple of weeks to collect money in from my receipts. Can you just wait a couple of weeks? Yes, all right. The seller may extend that time period, but the extension should be of reasonable length. The buyer should not be asking for a year, two years, in order to be able to pay. The buyer should only be asking for, and the seller should only be granting an extension of time which is reasonable in length. Now, you may ask, you shouldn't because you know already the answer. What is a reasonable length of a time extension? And a reasonable length is a length that is reasonable in the circumstances. So that's those first two dealt with. Now, the avoidance of the contract. If the buyer's breach is fundamental, for example, the buyer refuses to accept the goods, or the buyer fails to pay according to the contract and there's no extension. If the buyer has paid, the seller loses the right to avoid, unless it's in respect of late performance by the buyer, before the seller, I write it down. Before the seller has become aware that the buyer has paid. So if the seller doesn't know that the buyer has paid, the seller loses the right to avoid. But if he doesn't know that the buyer has paid, then the seller still has the right to avoid. He's not, a, I don't know why. I can't imagine why. If you have been paid already for the goods, just because you didn't know, why would you avoid when you find out, hey, I'm avoiding the contract? Why? Well, because you've not paid. Well, I have paid. Oh, have you? Oh, all right. I can't imagine why you would avoid once you were notified that the buyer has paid. If it's in respect of any other breach, and late performance of payment, in respect of any other breach by the buyer, the seller should do so within a reasonable time. That's a void. And I'm not going to ask you because I know you know. If it's in respect of any other breach by the buyer, the seller should avoid, it would give notification of avoidance within a reasonable time. Otherwise, they'll lose the right to avoid. Now, we move on to damages. As I did say, and it applies to both buyer and seller. If you remember, the four rights of the buyer, the four rights of the seller, uh, three rights of the seller. Um, the rights are applicable both buyer and seller are able to claim damages in the, event, in the event that they have suffered. Now, damages is a measure of monetary compensation. And as a general principle, if damages is a sufficient remedy, then damages will be awarded. Remember I mentioned equitable remedy earlier on in this lecture, and we came across specific performance and injunction, and there were a couple of others that I did say. Well, those equitable remedies will only be awarded in the event that damages is an insufficient remedy. But if damages is sufficient compensation for the injured party, then it's damages that will be awarded. Maybe claimed by either party, in addition to any other remedy like avoidance. It's monetary, it's claimed in compensation. The amount of damages awarded is limited to that which should have been reasonably foreseeable. So in the reasonable contemplation of the ordinary man, 
reasonably foreseeable. If there is something lying beyond reasonable foreseeability, then damages won't be awarded. When I say it's awarded, it's awarded against the breaching party. And it's the, the court will say, or the tribunal will say to the breaching party, you have injured this other party. Pay them money by way of compensation. But that money, that reasonable foreseeability can go on and, and suddenly becomes unreasonably foreseeable. How could I have known that by me not delivering on time, you would therefore have had to use some cheaper substitute as a result of which the building has fallen down. How could I have known that that was likely to happen? So it has to be within the reasonable foreseeability of the, in the mind of the breaching party, and that's the limit of the extent of the damages that will be awarded. In addition, the injured party. Now, the injured party could be the buyer or could be the seller, which is clearly obvious. The injured party could be the buyer, could be the seller. If it's the seller that's injured because the buyer is now refusing delivery, the seller, particularly in the context of perishable goods, but the seller should try to sell those goods at whatever reasonable price they can they shouldn't sell them for a silly knockdown price. Should try to sell them for a reasonable price. And then if that price that they do achieve is lower than the contract price, then they can sue the breaching buyer for the difference between the contract price and the sale price that they managed to achieve. So they will mitigate their loss. Equally, if it's the seller that's in breach, then the buyer has a duty to mitigate their damage. So if I am in contract to sell a dress to you, and it's a, just a standard out of inventory dress for say $300, so it's a good quality dress. And I say, I'm not selling it to you. It's not worth my while delivering this to you. So you say, okay, well, I'll have to go out and buy another dress, but I shall sue you for the difference. So you go out and you source the most amazing dress that, that even princesses would love to wear. And you buy this dress and say, it's cost me $40,000, so can I have a compensation piece of $39,700? No, it is incumbent upon you to do your best to buy a suitable replacement without being silly about it. So, by buying replacement goods and claiming only an amount paid in excess, but you have a duty to mitigate this damage that you will then subsequently claim from the breaching party. Breach of contract. The rights and obligations, the rights, if you remember, the rights are avoidance. Why? Because the parties breached. The right to receive payment or receive delivery, or the right to, to be paid, the right to expect delivery to be effective, right to proper performance. The rights only accrue because a breach has occurred. There is a party that is breaching the contract and therefore a party that has been injured. And breach of contract is defined as the failure of one party to perform their obligations. Well, we looked at the obligations. And there are two types, anticipatory breach and breach during performance. Anticipatory breach is a notification of a breach by one party to the other. Notification that the breaching party does not intend to go ahead with the contract. And this notification is before the due date for the contract to start. It is made in anticipation of the start of the contract. Breach during performance, therefore, is any breach that occurs after the due date for performance of the contract. So if we have a date, the 1st of June, then any time up to the start of the contract, that would be anticipatory. And any time after, that's during, during performance. 
So the contract date, obviously, is important. That has to do. It becomes a, when it becomes apparent, if it becomes apparent, the other party will not perform or will not be in a position or will not be able to perform their part of the obligation. If it becomes apparent to one party that the other party cannot perform, then that's anticipatory breach. A serious indication of their inability to perform. A credit worthiness is heavily in doubt. Maybe a letter from a receiver or a letter from a liquidator says the company's in trouble. Or indications arising from the other party's preparation. If the other party has failed, <coughs> I'm thinking of things like Olympic Games or Football World Cup, World Cup next year, isn't it? 2018 in Russia. If the Russians are giving indications that their World Cup locations and their World Cup uh, sites are not going to be ready in time for next year, then that would be indications arising from the other party's preparation to perform. They're not, they're not ready. In Qatar 2022, if they're not ready and there are indications that they will not likely be ready, then that will be indications of their inability to perform. In these situations, one party may suspend their own performance. Even if the due date for commencement has not yet been reached. But they have to notify the party that is not ready to perform their site. They have to notify the party where credit worthiness is in doubt and say, look, it seems to us that you're not going to be ready to receive these goods or you're not going to be in a situation where you can pay for these goods. So the potentially injured party has to give notice that it is their intention not to go ahead. And then the party, the other one, says, we will be ready. We will be ready. Or our credit weather is not in doubt. We have put money on one side and that we have money available to pay you. So the potentially injured party may suspend their own performance, but they give notice of their intention. When this notice is received, the other party gets assurance that everything will be ready. Uh, then we have to go ahead. When goods have already been dispatched, I've already told you that. When goods have already been dispatched before the potential breach becomes known, the seller can prevent delivery. The seller contacts the carrier and says, don't deliver. In which case, the seller won't deliver. Even though, even though the buyer may have the documents of title. Do you remember in an earlier uh, lecture where documents of title are handed over so that when the goods are received by ship, then down at the port, the buyer says, here are my documents of title, I can claim these goods. That was anticipatory breach. The breach during performance, I think this is relatively straightforward. I don't, I don't want to be seen simply to be reading out the originals because you can do that. So I, if I need to explain, then I shall explain. But I have a feeling that this particular page is relatively straightforward. I'm going to read it through to myself, but I'm expecting you to read it through. Every now and then I shall chip in. It was available to injure when already covered. Possible breach may be fundamental. Fundamental, all right, we'll have a look at fundamental. Fundamental breach is one that goes to the root of the contract. It's not an incidental breach. It sort of goes to the very, very root of the contract. And it's basically a major breach with reference to conformity. Quantity, quality, description, packaging, timing. These are fundamental breaches. So where one party is in fundamental breach, it's a major breach. One party gives notice they will not continue. The injured party may declare the contract is avoided and claim damages. Installment contracts, I will explain this, installment contracts. It, it says a 10 installment. Let's have a look at it. There's our 10 installment contract. Let's say 100 tons uh, and 10 tons per installment. The first installment comes through and the buyer looks at this and says, this is poor quality, this is awful quality. I can't accept this. This is terrible. I can't use it. 
So they reject that first installment. And they say to the seller, if that's what you can do, I'm avoiding the contract. The contract, you have failed to get proper, for, proper performance. You have failed to deliver goods that conform. And therefore, I'm treating the contract as rejected, revoked. I'm avoiding, not revoked, I'm avoiding the contract. So the contract is cancelled. Now the seller can take action and say, no, no, these goods are asked for a contract. And then it will go to a distribution tribunal. But that first instalment of 10, which fails to meet standard, that would uh, enable the buyer to reject the entire contract, to avoid the entire contract. It would be called a breach of condition. Because it's indicating to the buyer, this is the quality of the goods that we're expecting to deliver, and if you accept them, then that's an indication of the quality of the goods that you are prepared to accept. But if that first instalment is okay, and the second instalment is exactly the same as the first, and that's accepted, and the third is accepted, and the fourth is accepted, and the fifth, and the sixth, and the seventh one is poor quality. And the buyer looks and says, what's this you've sent? This is, this is rubbish. I can't use this. What happened to the, the quality that you've already delivered with those six? The buyer cannot avoid the contract. The buyer can give notice, the buyer can seek damages, the buyer can insist that the seller repairs this, this lack of conformity, but you can't reject the contract because substantially the contract is okay and the seller has indicated what is the quality that they will deliver. If this one fails to meet that quality, okay, we'll replace it, but you can't avoid the contract. That one... Would be, would be a breach of warranty, not a breach of condition. And in that situation, the contract continues to live. So if the first one is poor, we can avoid. If the seventh, say, is poor but the first six are all right, we can't avoid. That's a breach of condition. That's a breach of warranty. Whereabouts does condition change to warranty? At what stage, if that were poor quality, probably a breach of warranty. If that were poor quality, that would probably be a breach of condition. But that one, hmm, well that one, at what stage, somewhere in the middle, the right to avoid switches off and the right instead to replace switches on. And I don't think it's ever been decided. There's no definitive line. There's no um, established point at which we switch over from avoidable to not avoidable. The, this actually says able to reject the eighth. I, I did it there with the seventh, but the, the notes suggest the eighth. It's interesting. And I can't see how an exam question could be set. So what I've just done there um, is in reference to installment contracts. And an exam question would have to be really quite clear. The first installment was poor quality or the ninth instalment out of ten was poor quality. And I think that's the only way you could do it. If you said the fourth or the fifth, you, there's no way you could answer it. Okay. The effects of avoidance. Well, a contract is avoided, both parties are released. It's as though the contract never existed. Both parties are released from their obligations. If money has been paid, and then contract is avoided, that money must be returned. That money is refundable. If goods have been delivered and the contract is avoided, then those goods are returnable. But of course, then remedies must be available to the injured party. Claim damages. Well, we talked about damages, monetary compensation. Or go to a tribunal 
and see what the tribunal says. You have to accept delivery, or you have to pay damages, you have to pay compensation, or you have to repair the damage. You have to repair the damaged goods or replace the damaged goods. So a tribunal will come up with a negotiated settlement. Exercise any rights. Sometimes a contract will set out rights that are available to either party in the event of breach. So in that situation where forethought has been given, as to what should rightly happen in the event that either party should breach the contract, uh, then we thought about the possibility and therefore we are contractually bound to follow those set out rights. Claim recovery of any goods delivered or any cash paid. But restitution, this re I said, I have actually mentioned the word restitution earlier on this lecture. It's another equitable remedy. Uh, damages isn't. Damages is uh, it's called a common law remedy in English law. But restitution, restitutio in integrum, restitution in full. And restitution is another one of these equitable remedies. I wrote on the screen, I wrote um, specific performance and I wrote injunction. Those are the two big ones. But two others are rescission and restitution. If we need them later, I'll tell you about them but you don't really need to know much more about them at this stage. Okay, well, that's it for this chapter. Rights and obligations of the buyer and the seller.